Hey guys, welcome to another Idolized History. Today we're going to be talking about William the Conqueror. Perhaps one of my favorite historical figures, not because of the whole, you know, conquering all of England, but just because of the determination to take over an entire land and to complete your dream in less than a year. Love him or hate him, he is one of the most influential characters in history and I've been pretty excited to cover this. As well as, this is one of the characters that you guys voted to look at, so I am really, really happy to say this is the first video where my fans have chosen the topic. So I'm happy to present to you guys idolized history, William the Conqueror, also known as William the Bastard. In 1028, William would be born as a bastard to Robert the King of Normandy and place a small region in France. His mother would raise him until his father died in 1035 during a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. From there, the local lords of the region would fight for power over the small dukedom, leaving William's life in a state of chaos. During these early times, many of his guards and even a teacher would die in the carnage. However, with the help of the King of France, Henry I, he was able to survive and flourish as a young man. In the year 1042, William hit his teenage years, where he would be knighted by King Henry I, allowing him to directly take control of his duchy through what he would be referred to by others as the Bastard. During this time, he would become famous for several small sieges and skirmishes under France. These events would structure most of his political ideologies, making him into the ruler he would come to be. And during these times, he gained a taste for territorial expansion and conquest that would foreshadow the future inevitably. By 1064, William had captured two expansions for his duchy in the way of Brittany and Maine. Around this time, he would also meet Harold Godwinson after a shipwreck, imprisoning him until he agreed to support William's right to rule over England. It's important to note that this is contested by some historians who believed he helped William willingly, however, that's a fun little tangent for later. Around this time, he would meet the childless king of England, Edward the Confessor. Edward took a liking to William and promised him the throne of England once he passed away. A brief note before I continue on with the script of this story is that this is most likely coming up on the most important year of William the Conqueror's life, which is 1066. As far as anyone goes, when his New Year's resolutions came through for 1065 into 66, he said everything was going to change and it would be by his hand. Not physically, but metaphorically speaking. I like to think so moving forward. 1066 would prove to be a big year for William as Edward the Confessor would pass away. Harold Godwinson would renounce his support for William and instead try to take the throne for himself. The Council of English Lords sided with Godwinson as, as a result, William invaded England. William would amass a fleet and army to fulfill his invasion, and while William assembled his forces on the coast of France, he was delayed by the weather, causing Harold's armies to centralize a defense on the English eastern shores. Because of this, when the Norwegian army attacked via the North Sea, they were able to catch Harold off guard as he scrambled to bring his forces to the south. After Harold beat back the Norwegian invaders, they would immediately press to engage with William's army, resulting in the famous Battles of Hastings. The Battle of Hastings would take place at Senlick Hill, where Harold ordered his forces to build a shield wall. This shield wall would hold off William's army from multiple attacks and raids until a rumor began of William's death. After breaking formation and chasing William's army back down the hill to drive them off, William's cavalry was able to sweep through their ranks and crush their counterattack before riding back up the hill to take out the remaining defenders. By the end of the day, Harold Godwinson and his two brothers would be killed in combat. It is widely thought that Godwinson died of either an arrow to the eye or a sword blow to the chest. After this decisive battle, there was no further significant resistance for William taking the throne of England for himself. Following the Battle of Hastings, William made it his mission to seize the English treasury. During this time, he would stop out resistance from another heir to the English throne, Edgar Etheling, until they surrendered to William, allowing him to capture London. To do so, they would subdue multiple towns, fortifications, and castles until they finally surrendered to William's control. Finally, on Christmas Day, William was crowned King of England in Westminster Abbey, marking an end to an extremely busy year and one of the most quick methods of conquest ever shown in history. From 1067 to 1070, we enter into William's early rule, where he began to change the face of England as he saw fit. 
During the opening period of William's rule, he would begin by splitting up lands and handing them out to his barons. This would become more of the localized feudal system we are familiar with when we think of the economic system today. During this time, William would go back to Normandy, leaving England in control of his two regents. A fourth son of his, Henry I, would be born to his soon-to-be queen, Matilda. Shortly afterwards, Matilda would be coronated as queen consort. In 1070, troubles with the church would begin despite William being a very devout man. The tithe system would become more apparent, forcing more power into the hands of the church. Because of this, William refused to cede power to the church and got rid of all non-Norman bishops in England. He would then separate the ecclesiastical courts from the common ones, creating a division between the church and state. As a result of this, Norman's disapproval of Saxon locals, feuds, and rebellions began to rise against William, causing a lot of chaos around his rule. From 1070 to 1073, opposition to the throne would come in the form of Harewood the Wake. William began his retaliation against the Saxons who sought to depose him by accepting the guilt of his barons and starting a butchery campaign of total submission out of the Saxons. After this, a large swath of England would be left completely decimated in his wake, leaving few to depose him. Finally, a revolt of Harrowood the Wake was stomped out, which resulted in a complete submission of the Saxon people. Following this, he would enact the Forest Laws of England, which made life especially hard on Saxons and Normans who were trying to live in the region, making hunting and fishing practically impossible. Finally, in 1073, England would be relatively secure enough for William to focus on his lands in Normandy and to protect his borders there. 1076 to 1085 would mark a time in William's rule where he truly saw enemies in every direction. William would wage multiple skirmishes over borders with France and Anjou during this time. His son Robert would rebel against his father after never having the ability to experience royalty that his father had acquired. Then, towards 1085, a new threat would come in the form of the Scandinavians, forcing him back to England. With little in the way of security, trust, or forces to maintain his borders, he would begin efforts to maintain his rule and protect his lands from foreign invaders. 1086 to 1087 would be the final days of the Conqueror's rules as he would go out as the supernova he once came in as. During the final years of William's rule, he created a mass census that is known as the Domesday Book. The census showcased how large of a land grab William had over England, as well as how destitute the country had become. And this land would be divided between himself, the barons, and the church, leaving nothing else for the common man. Following this, William would lead an attack on Montes after a French raid, only to be injured in battle. Following this injury, William would die, leaving Normandy to Robert and his sword and English crown to his second son named after him. William would be buried in Normandy, being one of the most prolific rulers to have ever been in medieval history. Despite whether we like him or not, William the Conqueror has a legacy as either one of the most prolific conquerors or one of the most prolific bastards that we could look at. Though only a bastard who neither could read nor speak English, he revolutionized the language by adding French and Latin words to its dictionary. His views of the feudal system is widely something we think of today when considering the economic systems of the time. William lives on as an inspiration for folklore and mythology, as well as becoming a prolific conqueror to history. His Norman-born advisors and barons single-handedly helped shape England into a more powerful nation for the future. His considerations for a separation of church and state can still be echoed today in sentiment. And whether or not we believe that he was a good person, a bad person, a conqueror, or just a bastard who found a throne. I believe that William the Conqueror is definitely someone who deserves their spot in idolized history. Well, I sure hope that you guys enjoyed the history of William the Conqueror. I'm trying to get better with these things, and I really do hope that you guys will give me more recommendations in the future. I saw that the poll was out after I let out the uh, spear video. I had completely forgotten about it. To be honest, I'm terrible at checking these things. And I just want to say thank you to everyone that participated, to everyone that subscribes. I don't really think much of these videos, but I hope that they at least teach you something. Have a great day. Have a great night. I hope that you guys just take away something from it. Enjoy.